know the uh, Federal Trade Commission, and I refer to Coco for more, more detail on this, it seems to me extremely important legislation in, in the corporatist development, and was considered as such, and, and, and as the analog for I, the ICC federal reserve system, the agricultural subsidies, etc. There's also an inter interesting develop the Wilson, development during the Wilson administration, started during the Taft administration. This is pushing the social welfare end of the welfare corporate state. Um, this, is, this is the Commission on Industrial Relations, the United States Commission on Industrial Relations, which was set up in late 1912 by Taft, but really it hardly got started before you know, Wilson takes over and Wilson appoints the people and so forth. The uh, U.S. Commission on Industrial Relations, which was stimulated by industrial violence, uh, worker, worker violence and what to do about it, um, Against, it has, again, this is the first time really on a federal scale, we have this tripartite arrangement I've been referring to. Three labor representatives, three corporation representatives, all of whom incidentally were National Civic Federation types. The NAM was squeezed out of this arrangement. And three so-called public representatives who are public busybody types, social, social, social engineers. Uh, among the public representatives, representatives are with our old friend John R. Common, who plays an extremely important role in this whole business. Also, Mrs. J. Borden Harriman, uh, one of the famous Harriman family, who's, who becomes one of the, well, I'll refer to a little later, either tonight or tomorrow night, but, uh, one of the uh, upper class female social worker busybody types, which begin to proliferate in this period. Uh, the chairman of the, of the commission was, a, I guess, a genuine left winger named Frank Walsh, uh, I mean, to the left of the corporate common types. He was a lawyer and social worker, <coughs> and uh, he was put on because he was supposed to be a friend of John R. Cummins. I mean, that was his that was his cachet in this thing. So he was trusted by easily the National Civic Federation and proposed by. It. And it turns out they split later on during the work of the commission. Walsh was a little too leftish than the rest of them. And Cummins puts in as the research director, head of research for the commission, Charles V. McCarthy, Wisconsin, another Wisconsin progressive. Uh, and McCarthy is a very interesting guy. McCarthy was essentially a student of Commons, student in the cycle. He was the head of the Legislative Reference Bureau of Wisconsin, who engaged in many of these activities. He helped collaborate on the drafting of the Federal Trade Commission Act. He hailed Germany as a great, uh, as a great example of planning. He called it, quote, a wonderful example of the rest of the world. Uh, and uh, particularly the, the role of Bismarck and his great, one of his great economists, or so-called economist theoreticians, Otto Wagner, one of the historical school economists. <clears throat> and he he thought of the, he did his work on the Industrial Commission, he thought of the Industrial Commission as, as trying to bring the German model, Bismarck model, to the United States. Uh, he, he's one of the big figures in workman's compensation, pushing workman's compensation, pushing the whole Wisconsin idea and so forth. Um, well, one, of the, one of the McCarthy's lucubrations, I find some interest, when he was reminiscing one day, he said, quote, the backbone, the backbone, in other words, his thought on political economy, the backbone of my thought on political economy is that the state must invest in human beings in the same way as you invest in cattle on a farm. Um, I think it's kind of cute. It sort of, I think, expresses pretty directly the progressive intellectual outlook toward the, toward the masses out there. Uh, so, uh, having been a long-time uh, student and associate of Commons, he was he was, a, he was the research director, commissioning very very in of course with dumpers in the Anthem Valley. I should say, by the way, that John R. Commons, along with his, uh, his friend and ally Selig Perlman of the University of Wisconsin, were two great labor historians in the early part of the century. There were the not only historians of American labor unions in the United States, but the official setters down of what we can call the official AFL line of the craft union, monopoly unionism kind of uh, corporate involved in kind of a corporatist uh, framework kind of position. I'll get more to that when we get more to the unions later on. Charles B. McCarthy, in addition to being a corporatist, a progressive, a Cummins associate, and everything else, also turned out to have been a friend and classmate of John D. Rockefeller Jr. at Brown University. Uh, classmates keep popping up all the time. It's really, uh, really incredible. It can't be a coincidence. I don't believe it. <laughs> um, by this time, Rockefeller, I think maybe this is a little bit, this is kind of speculative, but maybe, I think under the hammer of blows of Morganism, the hammer of blows of, of corporatism, etc., begins to begin to, begins to adapt to the situation and begin to get a more of a, more of a social work, uh, progressive 
quote, progressive kind of approach coming in. For example, the Rockefeller sets up an industrial relations department as part of a fairly newly set up Rockefeller Foundation. One of the one of the big shots in this, by the way, was uh, certain William Lyon Mackenzie King, who was who was a Rockefeller Foundation person, and some, somehow pops up as Prime Minister of Canada for about 50 years or something. At least when I was growing up, he was always the Prime Minister of Canada. Um, <laughs> James um, and the, 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 so the relationship between the Rockefeller Foundation and McCarthy was quite close. Jerome and Rockefeller in general, I guess. Jerome Green was a personal Rockefeller aide, writes to McCarthy in October 1914. He says, he says under w w William Lyon Mackenzie King's direction, uh, the Rockefeller Foundation might, quote, gradually convince the public both of our disinterestedness and of our strictly scientific method, unquote. Again, you have this idea of the, of, uh, and in a sense you have the Rockefellers, okay, I, okay I'm going to turn to science too, in quotes. You know, so, so these guys can do it, I can do it. Um, which I guess is the beginning of the great Rockefeller Foundation career, in a sense. I mean, the great career of, of finding and developing uh, promising scholars. So we now have the, the last, the latest fruits of the Rockefeller. Uh, the Rockefeller interest in scholarship, of course, is Henry Kissinger, our beloved uh, foreign policy czar. <laughs> um, <coughs> so, um, the uh, what happens is that there's a split in the commission. McCarthy is kicked out by, uh, under Walsh's aegis. And uh, we have three reports, basically. We have, the, we have several reports, Commons Rights Report, and other than the various independent reports of the commission. Uh, one, of the, incidentally, one of the key people in the commission, one of the things about Commons is he becomes a, uh, he promotes a Commons report, presages the New Deal almost, you know, almost line by line. He, he, he sets forth a, a, a situation which will later become a similar, very, very similar to later NRA, the Wagner Act, the WPA, and CCC. All these things are prefigured in the Commons Report in 1915. The, the Industrial Commission reports are written in 1915. Commons uh, <coughs> sidekick, the Assistant Director of Research, who was Assistant of McCarthy, is another guy who appears among our rulers from now, from then on. A lot of, an amazing number of people start around this period and continue ever since. They sort of live to the age of 110 or something. And they, they've only died out fairly recently. And, and they start with World War, around this World War I period. One of them is Billy Lyserson, uh, who was the, the labor economist, student of Commons, close associate of McCarthy, who's uh, been pushing here state public works for depressions and uh, state unemployment services. And he comes up in a new deal and then during World War I and so forth and so on. One of, the, well, one of the largest uh, flour millers in the world at the time. And Ballard's report outlines the following steps that should be taken to cure the industrial problem and so forth. Um, the, uh, in, in, in favor of raising wages, various government steps to raise wages, all right? One, you should restrict immigration as a way of raising wages. Very sound, if, you, if your interest is in raising American wage rates, one of the ways to do is to keep everybody out. <coughs> Uh, two, to have a national minimum wage law to raise wages. Three, workmen's compensation laws. Four, factory inspection laws, which of course impose, as we've seen with meatpacking, impose higher costs on cartelized the system, impose higher costs on competitors, on small competitors. Uh, next, the federal eight-hour day law to make sure that those firms which are, which are um, unesthetic enough to have a 10-hour day or 12-hour day should be forced into the line by their eight-hour day competitors. The Federal Employment Service and Federal Public Works during recessions. <coughs> also, and all of this is practically the entire New Deal, not only 33, 35, but really also uh, 33, 38. You know, whole, the whole spiel, I think, is set out in the Commons Report, the Ballard Report, etc. Uh, one of the things, kind of a cute thing, which prefigures the CCC and maybe a few other institutions in the world, it also calls for, quote, government concentration camps, where <laughs> Where workers, where work with a small wage would be provided, <coughs> supplemented by agricultural and industrial training, and we see here at the beginning of the great CCC concept of out there in the great forestry army, as it's called, uh, the whole idea of you know, force, <laughs> force government labor. <coughs> they used the word concentration camps in those days. It had not yet been uh, rendered uh, inoperable. <laughs> <laughs> The word, not the, not the, not the policy. Uh, 
So who runs against who runs against Wilson in 1916 after these past that corporate has performed has been put in? I haven't mentioned the Federal Reserve System yet because I'm going to go back to coming to that. That plus the Federal Reserve System, all these fantastic corporatist reforms have come in. Who is going to be found to run against this great man? Charles Evans Hughes, 1916, Wall Street lawyer, who turns up at least after his defeat as a as a as a uh, attorney for Standard Oil Company in New Jersey. I cannot refrain from saying that Hughes is a Rockefeller person. Cannot cannot stop myself from saying that. Uh, he's also a member of the same Baptist Bible class as John D. Rockefeller Jr. <laughs> <laughs> And he, of course, he was beaten. He was only almost won, but he was finally beaten. Okay. So in short, it was the Morgan, the Wilson Morgan uh, continuation of power. Uh, okay, what's the uh, Federal Reserve System? We'll come back to that, of course, later on. But, uh, bear with me here. The uh, thing about the Federal Reserve System basically was it succeeded. Well, first of all, it was backed by almost every banker. I really don't know. I don't know. Uh, there might have been bankers that opposed it in, in detail, certainly, but the, the concept, certainly the big bankers all favored it. There were precious few people that were against it anyway, uh, in general. The, uh, I think the major reason for that is the fact that the Federal Reserve System succeeds the national banking system. The national banking system was sort of a, 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 was kind of an abortion. The national banking system was a halfway house from free banking, hard money free banking, at least free banking kind of system, which we had before the Civil War, to a central bank on the other hand. In other words, what we have, uh, basically what we have uh, before the Civil War is that it was a free, it's a free banking setup, with the exception of the first and second banks in the United States. But after Jackson got rid of the second bank in the United States, we had a decentralized banking system. Um, much of it was hard money, the free, the, we had free, free entry into the banking system. Uh, and some Western states' banks were declared unconstitutional, uh, and they, of course, there were no banks in that area. But there were, there were, uh, there was considerably less inflation under the free banking system, even though wild quote wildcat unquote, than there has been there was later on. The uh, anyway, this is one system, and in the free banking kind of system, the hard money position, the, the pure gold position, the uh, the Jacksonians, and previous to that, the Jeffersonians, really. Um, at least, at least had a fighting chance. In other words, what you have is you have a continuing drive by the Jacksonians for, for outlawing banks altogether, or, or, or ensuring that they, that they pay specie immediately. One of the reasons why uh, <clears throat> it's always been said that free banking leads to wildcat, wildcat banking and runaway inflation. One of the reasons why there was, uh, it didn't, but one of the reasons why there was more inflation than there would have been under a real free banking system is that every time the banks got in any kind of real trouble, sort of massive trouble, Thought about by their overexpansion, the government, state, and federal allow them get got them off the hook by allowing allowing them to suspend specie payments. In other words, to stop paying their debts uh, until this crisis is over. In the meantime, of course, they can collect the debts. They can enforce the collection of their debts, the debts to them in the courts. But while all this was going on, they could they they were suspended. A moratorium was declared, so they wouldn't have to <coughs> pay their own debts to their depositors or note holders, I should say, largely. This this great tradition. Uh, letting the banks off the hook begins uh, nefarious. I don't want to deal too much with this. I don't want to go even further back, far as my back. <laughs> uh, but the the the, uh, the this, this this nefarious tradition begins with the uh, in the War of 1812, and in order the, the the largest center of capital investment and wealth was New England, which as we all know was opposed to the War of 1812 against Britain. So in order to finance the war effort, the the, number, the administration had to turn to the new banks popping up. The new banks inflated like mad. The government spends the money on munitions and so forth, and, and manufactured goods produced in New England. Uh, the New England banks call upon the, the new banks of Pennsylvania and Kentucky, etc., for redemption. They ain't got the money. They ain't got the gold. So they go. Ba- they have to go bankrupt. This is end the the um, modern banking system, so to speak. That's the origins of it. And the federal government says, "Okay, we suspend specie payments." This is the black the black month of August 1814 happened. Not only is this this continue for the duration of the war. But it went on from then on until early 1817. So that for two and a half years, the banks were <coughs> let off the hook. Uh, there were two ways out. I don't want to go into detail on this, but there were two ways out faced at the time uh, by the congressmen and theoreticians. One way was to 
get rid of the banks, the fraction, you know, the banks that couldn't pay, the bankrupt banks, and go back to a gold system, or a gold silver system, I should say. And the other was to set up a new bank in the United States, which would inflate enough to, to keep these banks afloat, which was the solution that was adopted. Uh, at any rate, but after the bank, second bank in the United States is eliminated, we have a, a free banking system with hard money as a viable trend, let's say. After the Civil War, the whole condition changed, the whole, the whole system changes with two things. One, the greenbacks, which are you know, fiat money, not redeemable in gold or silver, and it took, them, it took them 14 more years to get rid of the greenbacks. They got the greenbacks back on a gold basis. And the National Banking Act, which one outlawed state banknotes, there was banknotes produced by state banks, outlawing uh, by producing and by imposing extra tax of 10% on state banknotes. And setting up a whole new national banking system with reserve requirements, etc., centralized, deliberately centralized in Wall Street, the, 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 national, the national banks of Wall Street, and then pyramiding on top of that, uh, smaller city banks having deposits in the central in the, in the Wall Street banks, and the rural banks having deposits in the, in the smaller city banks. So it's got a permanent expanded credit kind of system based on the national on the central Wall Street banks as the major reserve, central reserve cities. And their reserves, their money supply they were allowed to issue was based on, in turn, upon government, federal government bonds. It's a very peculiar kind of system. Uh, <clears throat> in other words, the more government bonds they bought, the more, the more uh, credit they could issue. So this was a kind of, this was a system which didn't satisfy really anybody too well. Um, the, um, the, uh, for one thing, and, and so, they, they looked around for reform. It was very difficult at this point to go back to, first of all, it took them as I said, 14 years to get back to gold even, to get back to a gold standard. So, but, so this sort of exhausted the hard money people. Besides, the hard money people were sort of dying out by this time. And it becomes very, to, to go back to the free banking system before the Civil War would have, would have made a you know, titanic revolutionary kind of change in the system, which, which the, whatever gold bugs were left uh, were not in a position to, you know, to try to accomplish. So with this sort of alternative kind of dead and defunct or forgotten, increasingly forgotten by the general public, by economists, by bankers. Uh, the, the next alternative looming up was a fully going, pressing on to a fully centralized banking system with the, with the, with the, with the Federal Reserve, with the imitation of the Bank of England, which pioneered in this, in this thing and so forth. Uh, now most of us think, uh, looking back, most textbooks think of they say the central bank is extremely important. We must have a central bank in order to restrict the banks, the, the you know, commercial banks, from expanding credit and inflating the credit excessively. This is the usual way in which the, this kind of thing is sold to the general public. You should be no surprise by this time that this is sort of, uh, again, an Orwellian system in, re in reverse. This is not the way the bank, the, this is not the arguments of the bankers themselves and the economists themselves promoting it used for the Federal Reserve System. The argument was, this darn national banking system is too inelastic. The money supply is, quote, inelastic, unquote. In other words, we ain't got enough of it. The, we, we haven't, the banks are not allowed to expand credit enough, especially during recessions. So we need some kind of instrument to ensure uh, more and, and more and better inflation, more and better expansion of uh, money and bank credit. The, uh, there were several problems. One was we need what Walter Badgett, the Mephistophelian figure who was the theoretician of the Bank of England in the 19th century, so the, the central bank has one important, very important function to be a lender of what he called lender of last resort. Lender of last resort meaning that there always should be a government, a government sponsored bank out there in the, as a sort of a deus ex market on a bail out any bank that's really getting into trouble. Uh, so, we, so every bank knows deep in its heart there's always a central bank there to bail it out, to lend it money and so forth, to, lend, to tide it over any kind of real emergency. This was accepted as a, as a brilliant stroke, master stroke in, in banking theory. Um, the, uh, and then they felt it was necessary also, as Coco points out here, the national, under the national banking system, was, decentralization was popping up. The Chicago banks now are becoming part of the Central Reserve, and the more and more state banks. Uh, in other words, you had less, less and less centralization. It was felt by the, by the large bankers. They had to recentralize again and impose you know, a, a central control, which would seem to be getting out of hand. Uh, also, we had the growth of the Bank of America, a state bank, which is completely outside the establishment in those days. So, yeah. um, so we had, um, in, this, in this situation, 
uh, once again, the economists have punked out. In other words, the economists which previously to this period had, had been hard money people. And they had also been gold bugs to one extent or another. Uh, by this time, the, hard, the old hard money economists had dropped out and had died off. And, uh, and then it was just a question of sort of jockeying with which, which kind of central bank should we have. And we accepted almost on every hand that we, need, we have to imitate advanced countries like England and Germany, etc., and have our own central bank. The, uh, and there's a whole litany here, which I need not repeat, that Coco mentioned, all the guys who were pushing for, this, for, for some kind of Federal Reserve Bank. And there's all sorts of jockeying back and forth. I don't think there's, in the long run, they're very important. The point is, almost everybody had one of their own kind of central bank, and we, we, we wind up with something. The, uh, some of the key figures, again, in this, the... Uh, the famous Jekyll's Island, Jekyll Island Conference, which, which, which figured in, in Westbrook Pegler's <laughs> demonology from then on, until so the day he died. One of the things which was one of the sources for writing the Federal Reserve System. Uh, at this conference were Paul Warburg of, from Kimmo, Frank Vanderlip of National City Bank, who becomes very important throughout this thing as a great theoretician of inflation. Henry P. Davison, a Morgan partner, uh, Charles Norton of the First National Bank, and of course, uh, Nelson Aldrich. And anyway, with, with all this jockeying back and forth, we wind up with the Federal, Federal Reserve System. <laughs> Before I get to the essence of what happens there for the Federal Reserve System, uh, I want to mention a few words about the man whom I will turn to later, later lectures. Uh, the man who becomes the virtual king of the Federal Reserve System until the day he died. Uh, not exclusively at the beginning, but enough to establish working control. And by the mid-20s, the early 20s, he has absolute control until he dies at the end of 1928. Benjamin Strong, governor of the Federal Reserve Bank in New York. Um, and it was all during the 20s, by the way, there was a constant battle between the Federal Reserve Board in Washington, which one would have thought would be the head of the system, and Strong, who was the head of the Federal Reserve, Federal Reserve Bank in New York. Strong wins out. He's uh, in having a lot of clout and being in New York and buying and selling bonds and all the rest of it, close to the source. He also had a lot of political and economic clout, <clears throat> in addition to being a charismatic figure. I don't think we should, usually the historians interpret this, interpret Strong's uh, ascendancy in the Federal Reserve System to his charisma. Uh, I sh you should probably know by now that I, I, I don't find charisma a, success, a sufficient ex explanation. Benjamin, who was Benjamin Strong? First of all, he had been head of Bankers Trust Company, which was a Morgan Trust Company had been set up a few years, uh, 1903. Uh, second of all, his closest friends in the world, and I mean not only business friends and people who had pushed him all along the way, but also social friends and golf club pals and all the rest of it, were Henry P. Davison, Morgan partner, and Dwight Morrow, Morgan partner. Um, strong when he got the call to be head of the Federal Reserve System. He's also an old pal of Ella Hugh Root, just to sort of cement the whole thing, and Thomas W. Lamont, another Morgan partner. At any rate, um, comes, the, comes the call from the Muslim administration to appoint Benjamin Strong as head of the Federal Reserve Bank in New York. He sort of hangs back in a shy and modest manner. I don't know if I can really competent to do this. He was, he was uh, impleted with and so forth and so on by uh, Davison and Morrow to accept, this, accept the post. Okay, so our, our hypothesis from now on, which we will test as we go along, is that Benjamin Strong was essentially you know, parenthesis Morgan. Okay. <laughs> uh, this is the Federal Reserve System. Here I refer to a great book, which is, which is a book which is, which is published by Macmillan, published by several distinguished co-authors, the, the senior author of whom was one of the most distinguished banking theoreticians of the 20th century, Charles, Charles A. Phillips. Uh, yet it was a book published in the 30s by Macmillan, a distinguished publishing company, yet the book bombed totally. I mean, it was never heard from again, either by economists or by anybody else. He had one of the best books on this whole period, starting both theoretically and empirically, starting with 1914 and continuing on uh, you know, down through the 20s and the early 30s. Uh, so I refer you to this for further you know, elucidation of this whole thing, plus other books on my bibliography. <laughs> the um, mean Banking in a Business Cycle by Felix McManus and Nelson. Sorry. Uh, what do we do here? We have a situation if... if well, this way. Supposing we have a 
bunch of start off with a bunch, let's say, of independent banks. Forget a minute about the national bank permitting. That makes it just more complicated. We have a bunch of independent banks, each of which are required. The, the average reserve requirement before the Federal Reserve Act. The average reserve requirement was ten uh, percent. In other words, the banks could pyramid. Uh, well, national bank notes could issue notes. The national banks could issue notes. They could pyramid notes and deposits uh, ten to one on top of their reserves, which uh, were either gold or you know government bonds or other banks, depending on where they stand on the pyramid. Uh, let's say there's let's say there's gold in the simplified bank. So we have a ten to one on top of this. Oh, excuse me, it wasn't ten percent, it was twenty percent. Giving away the punch line here. Twenty percent. It was five to one currently. So these banks are allowed and the average is I'm doing twenty one, but I'll make it twenty, make it simpler. We have allowed a five to one permitting by each, each uh, let's say each bank. Okay, so we centralize reserve. We take all of the government forces, well not for induces and cousins in many other ways. Get the the bank to yield most of their reserves to the Federal Reserve Bank, and then we create the Federal Reserve Bank. Let's say they get all the reserves, and now the Federal Reserve Bank, the reserves of the national banks become the uh, deposits with the Federal Reserve Bank, checking account, so to speak, with the Federal Reserve Bank. So, uh, so now we have the gold centralized in the Federal Reserve Bank. Incidentally, this is one of the arguments that's constantly being used, not only because the federal, the national banking system is too inelastic, in other words, not enough money, not inflationist enough, but also we need centralization of reserves. So we economize on reserves, as the, as the, uh, as the uh, slogan. But what, what this meant, economizing on reserves, was here we have, if, if, if they just you know, put reserves in the central sort of bin here, we still have uh, a 20 to 1, a 5 to 1 setup, 5 to 1 ratio. However, now we have the Federal Reserve System, the Federal Reserve Bank themselves, are allowed to expand 3 to 1, 35 percent. So let's say 3 to 1. Uh, 3 to 1 on top of their gold. So now, in other words, the gold, let's say the, gold, the amount of gold centralized is the same. Now the, the, uh, the Federal Reserve Banks are allowed to expand 3 to 1 on top of that. So this means that by this process of centralizing and having this 35% limit, we have an allowed 3 to 1 expansion of money and credit. That was the, the, the bank credit supply can go up by 3 to 1, permitted to go up by 3 to 1. And usually in banking history, if, you, if the government permits banks to expand money on top of reserves, they'll do it, except in very, you know, except in deep depressions when they can't find anybody to lend money to because they might go bankrupt. But generally, this is, this is it, either immediately or in a couple of years, if they permit a 3 to 1 expansion of reserves, they can expand 3 to 1. So this, this allows for a 3 to 1 expansion of bank credit, of money and bank credit. <clears throat> in addition to that, as if this weren't enough, uh, this, this engineered inflation, inflationary potential of 3 to 1, by inflation, by, by the way, I mean an increase in money supply, supply of money and bank deposits. In addition to that, the Federal Reserve Act reduced the average reserve requirements by statute in half, from 21% to 10%. And actually, it was 11% in 1914 and 10 percent later, but basically, it was reducing in half from approximately 20 percent to approximately 10 percent, which, which means that instead of, addition, before you could permit, the banks could permit 5 to 1 on top of reserves, now they could permit 10 to 1 on top of reserves. We, have, we now have a, an extra two-fold inflation on top of a three-fold uh, by the centralization process. So you, the mechanism of the Federal Reserve Act immediately ensures a potential of six to one inflation on top of the previous supply of money. It's an enormously, enormous inflationary engine sold to the public, sold to the general public, and to, and to dumb dumb, or I don't know, of course not, that, to deluded college students ever since as a restriction on inflation. <laughs> as a way of combating these evil commercial banks, the private banks are out there inflating, we need this Federal Reserve System to, to hold them in. Actually, just the other way around, the bankers needed it to push them along. Uh, <clears throat> now, this, this six to one potential was limited. It starts off uh, fortuitously uh, at the end of 1913, so it was just about in time for the war effort. Uh, a couple of, only a couple of years were into the war effort. This six to one potential was limited by money in circulation by the public. In fact, the public could take some money out once in a while. Uh, this is a limiting factor. It's always a limiting factor in bank credit inflation. 
If all of us, for example, if the entire country suddenly cashed in their bank deposit tomorrow, it would be an excellent. This would be, you know, if I, if I were asked to give advice to the general public, how can we stop inflation? I wouldn't say don't eat meat. I'd say cash in your bank deposits. <laughs> it would be a very effective, if a little disturbing way of, uh, <laughs> of uh, limiting inflation. <laughs> Get your money out of the banks. Um, and uh, also, the, the 35% was, 40, yeah, it was altered. It was 40% against Federal Reserve. Now, so anyway, these are, these are uh, minor considerations. The other problem is that uh, there's a disturbing potential. We're still on the gold standard. There's still a disturbing potential that the public might cash in all this stuff, not only the Federal Reserve notes and the, and the National Bank's deposits, for gold. This could wreck the whole thing. So a big campaign is launched by the Federal Reserve System to, in various ways to get the public not to use gold anymore, to, to reduce gold to the sort of thing, uh, gold coins, particularly the sort of thing that you give to the kids on Christmas, you know, like one gold coin. Here's a, here's a gold dollar, you know, find all the people. Yeah, sort of it reduces this sort of ceremonial status. Uh, one of the things they did is to stop issuing gold certificates <laughs> uh, and replacing gold certificates. Now, gold certificates had been issued by the, uh, by the Treasury. They were 100% backed by gold, so they were extremely sound and hard, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. These were replaced by Federal Reserve notes, which were backed, you know, 40%, like two and a half to one on top of gold. And which then replaced as a, as a general cash in circulation, uh, ousted, where gold certificates were retired and replaced by these Federal Reserve notes. And what, incidentally, one of the ways by which um, how, does, how, does the, how does the government get get its get its power over the commercial bank? How does, how does it ensure the Federal Reserve has all this power to, to regulate, control, and inflate together? Uh, basically, two ways. One is all the national banks were forced to become members of the Federal Reserve System. But more important than that, the state banks were not. But more important than that, the real guts, the real heart of the Federal Reserve control was the Federal Reserve now had a monopoly in the issuance of cash, the issuance of paper money. Before that, as I said, the national banks, the private national banks like Chase National Bank, could issue their own banknotes. Uh, now this is prohibited. It becomes illegal on the pain of death, torture, and whatever for any private bank to issue a banknote. Only the Federal Reserve banks can do that. So this means that if you want to get your money from the from Chase or Chembank or whatever, and the Chembank has to use their reserves to go to the Federal Reserve and buy their buy cash from the Federal Reserve System. So this becomes the control. So this means that everything pyramid on top of the Federal Reserve Bank which has the supply of cash in its mitt. Uh, is this the six to one potential weren't enough? There was another inflationary device that occurred in the Federal Reserve System. Before 1913, the same 21% requirement was levied by the federal government uh, to time deposits as it was to demand deposits. This was changed now, and the, the time deposit minimum requirement was lowered first to 5% and then to 3% by 1917, which is almost zero. I mean, it's practically almost unlimited. Now, there's a whole controversy among economists about time deposits. Is it really part of the money supply? Isn't it? I contend that it is uh, part of the money supply. For one reason, is you can, you, you've got, you, you can get your money out. Um, uh, and, and, you know, right away. I mean, this, there might be a little clause there in the fine print saying if the bank can wait 30 days. But if a bank ever really tried, if a savings bank trying to make you, a well, commercial bank, trying to make you wait 30 days, they'd be bankrupt very quickly. That'd be a big run on the bank. It would have been before 1933 when the whole ball game changes with the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. But at any rate, so they couldn't really do that. This is really a dead letter. And you have a situation where you can, take, you can take your passbook down to the bank and get your money out. And you expect that you can do it. You think that the money is there even though, of course, you're deluded in thinking that. <laughs> At any rate, so, it, so the time deposit method becomes a very, int very interesting way, all during the World War I and during the 20s, by which the, the commercial banks could inflate even more than the you know, 5 to 1, the 10 to 1, by trying to shift people from the man deposits to time deposits. Every time they did that, this could give more of an inflationary potential. Uh, okay, the result of this titanic change in the, federal, in the banking system uh, which I say came along very fortuitously to finance our uh, the war effort uh, and the post war one war effort as far as said, a lot of the war equipment comes after after the war. Uh, we have this kind of this situation as well. This is bank deposit. I think it's only demand deposit. I should have checked on that. The source of the table is not good. You can swing with the time deposit. I don't think. 
At any rate, bank deposits, total bank deposits, uh, member of banks, well, let's just say total bank deposits. In 1914, $18.6 billion. 1920, $37.7 billion. In other words, a doubling, approximately a doubling of the total money supply in the form of bank, de of bank deposits. Uh, in other words, approximately 100% increase in money supply in a six year period, which is a, a heck of a lot, uh, say the least. <laughs> Wholesale price level using uh, 1913 is setting 1913 equal to 100. 1914 was 97, 1920, 243, which means a two and a half fold increase in wholesale price level. <coughs> approximately 150% increase. The, uh, so we have uh, inflation of prices fueled in the classic manner by an inflation of money supply. Um, the World War I was badly, very badly financed on any, on any kind of conservative or sound criterion. I'm going to look at that. The, uh, the usual conservative criterion for financing a war effort is if you're going to finance a war effort, you should finance most of it at least by taxes, by levying taxes. Because if you don't do that, you're going to finance it by inflation, which is considered to be kind of a bad thing to do. Uh, the Napoleonic Wars, to give a, give a kind of uh, comparative analysis here, and, uh, England financed the Napoleonic Wars, which went on for a long, long time for us, 63% uh, by tax revenue, by levying taxes for this expenditure. World War I, the United States in World War I, World War I financed 25% of its expenditures by taxes, the rest of it by inflationary debt. Uh, <coughs> There are other details about what happens in each couple of years, etc. But I don't really think that's necessary to go into it because uh, I think this this is kind of the basics, the basic framework. The um, well, this sets the stage, let's say, for the World War One inflation and the post-war period coming on. I think. There's still some time to uh, run a little bit, at least, to the another aspect of progressivism, which is very important, which has been alluded to here and there. Uh, the, uh, local progressivism, or municipal, or urban city local progressivism. Here I refer you to the classic, justly classic article by Samuel Hayes called The Politics of Reform in Municipal Government, the Progressive Era, which has been anthologized all over the place, and uh, several other th things which I will mention. The, um, what you have here, and, and, and this is alluded to, I think Forrest was alluded to Lindsay, the essence of John Lindsay, and I really think this fits in beautifully in this whole setup. What you have basically is a, a, a great drive for an urban reform, really to smash the, and this, this runs through the whole setup, to smash the power of the local ward healer machine type politicians, the old politics, you know, power, to smash their power and to replace this power by new tech. Te technician, expert, upper class, uh, centralized, centralized government. As compared to the older politics, which is essentially decentralized, ward oriented, neighborhood, community control, as we call it, uh, kind of setup. Uh, replace this by out of politics, taking municipal government out of politics and into this new, great new, uh, into the light, into the levitated light. Uh, the, uh, the essence of this, before getting into any details on this, uh, not only, incidentally, in addition to being an economic determinist, which I proclaim, I'm also an ethnic determinist, <laughs> or the two of them often force jive. <laughs> the, um, what you have here, and, and, and during this, this whole period, of course, one of the, one of the things that you have is this mass, massive immigration from uh, southern and eastern Europe. And uh, as Forrest has mentioned, the, 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 the original native people, the wasp, the, wasp, uh, you know, the wasp who had been here, are kind of scared by this whole setup. Um, by this new invasion, so to speak. And in, every, in, in many aspects of life, and I'll, I'll be getting later on probably, undoubtedly tomorrow night, the public school revisionism, which is also part of a great new thing which has popped up in the last couple of years, public school revisionism in the progressive period. Uh, all these things mesh in. All the, the whole thing is an attempt to, uh, to take urban politics out of the hands of the, of the new immigrant groups, uh, well, old, and old immigrant groups, Irish, Italian, Jewish, etc., to take it out of their hands and into the hands of the upper class WASP establishment. 
so to speak. Um, and one of the things which were one of the one of the bases is I'm going to get the prohibition tomorrow night too. Is that one of the bases, one of the key bases of neighborhood control by the local ward healer politicians was the saloon. The neighborhood saloon was sort of a key social center. One thing is the Catholic, the Catholic immigrants drank a lot. At least in contrast to the Protestants who drank hardly at all, at least in public, or publicly. And this whole this whole thing about drinking, which comes all the way back, I guess, at least to the 18th, 19th century, and probably before that. At any rate, this whole thing about drinking, and the and the and the Catholics usually drank, and also Germans drank, I guess, in general. I, I, I suppose German Protestants also. So you have the whole thing about hey, these evil Germans, evil Irish, evil Italians, and they're drinking. And here you have the here you have the wasps who don't drink, at least supposedly don't drink, and. Uh, and, and fortuitously, and along with this, you have the neighborhood saloon, and the saloon keeper as being the key ward politician. They go to him for favors, and he's sort of the beloved figure, and they all say, you know, hi, Joe, Joe, and that sort of stuff. He often gets elected to the, to the board of aldermen. And so part of the idea of smashing the local neighborhood is the idea of smashing the, s- the saloon and the brewery industry, which anyway is in the hands of the evil Germans to begin with. So you can, you can bust them along with the local <laughs> saloon keeper or something, added, <laughs> and added, uh, you know, grace. Uh... So all these things that are happening together, it's, it's really almost like a systematic, systemic kind of approach on every level, on a social and settlement house level, and, and, the, city, and the city commissioner government uh, concept, which comes in, and the city manager concept, which comes in, and prohibition, which comes in. And see, I regard prohibition as really also part of this whole corporatist framework. And the public school, tightening up of the public school thing, which comes in, and crushing the immigrant, which also comes in in this, this, in this, in this period. <coughs> um, the um, a part of this, I was I was very interested. I was talking to Religio after Forrest uh, talk this morning because he mentioned the whorehouse question, and uh, <laughs> it seemed to me I got and he and I had a flash of insight, <laughs> created a flash of insight in this whole thing because in addition to the saloon, which was you know of course, even more important than the whorehouse, but also the whorehouses were kind of a neighborhood ethnic. <laughs> old politics <laughs> kind of setup, And I had thought <laughs> that um, my, my analysis of the Mann Act, and here I have to, I, I feel there's a correction, I'm going to deal with this more tomorrow night, correction of my, of my revered mentor, H.L. Mencken, in this whole period. H.L. Mencken, for example, saw the Mann Act and Prohibition as a, as a purely moral morality thing, with, with, with what he called cow country Baptists and Protestants <laughs> rising up <laughs> from there. <laughs> From their ranches and dung heaps or whatever to impose uh, impose these moral morality laws on their betters on the urban urban folk. The uh, in this context, of course, um, um, Megan uh, defined Puritanism and one of the great one of the great definitions of Puritanism of our epoch, which is the Puritanism Puritanism is the haunting fear that somebody somewhere might be happy. <laughs> And uh, but I think I think more. And also, I think he had an economic. He had, he had essentially an economic analysis of that too. Essentially, what he I think what he said about the Mann Act was that well, if this is a form of an agrarian farmer Methodist Baptist uh, imposition, because what the what the farmers are saying is they don't have the money you see to transport women across state lines for immoral purposes. <laughs> they haven't got the cars or whatever they and, they, and the dough. And they well, they're. <laughs> Their immoral purposes are, are intrastate. They're on the farm. <laughs> so the Mann Act becomes a farmer, <laughs> a farmer a smashing of urban, you know, wealthier and more affluent and more cosmopolite and more mobile urban types. Uh, in addition to that, he also had an economic analysis of the farmer and prohibition. What he said was that, the, that the, 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 you know, the urban person has to buy his liquor from somewhere. This is, you know, interstate and so forth. Someone is visible and can be outlawed. The farmer makes his own moonshine. He can never really outlaw that very successfully. So we're out there in the backyard. Uh, so any, so here again, you have this uh, uh, sort of farm orientation. But I think there's more to it than that. It's not just the farmer. It's also, for various reasons, the the uh, our, our centralizers again, our corporate reform types, uh, moving in a, an alliance, obviously with the. Former Methodist Baptist uh, ideologists, so to speak, moving in for their own purposes to smash the saloon, to smash the brewers, to smash the evil German conspiracy. Certainly during World War One, Leonard Lidgett has done more research on this than I had. During World War One, there's a whole thing, not only about this hysteria by George Creel, etc., that the but the German conspiracy is also the German conspiracy is part of the brewing industry in, in general was part of the German international Kaiser conspiracy. The, the, the very act of drinking beer 
the, you know, the sign of loyalty to the Kaiser, and therefore he's stamping it out as part of a patriotic you know, war effort. <coughs> of course, prohibition really comes in during the, during World War One. Uh, the uh, well, since I was started with prohibition, let me let me let me, finish, let me do the prohibition thing. There, I was going to do the Samuel Hayes thing. This is somehow we've gotten more into this. <laughs> Uh, here I refer you to James Timberlake's work on uh, Prohibition of the Progressive Movement. Um, what you had in Prohibition, and presumably also on the, on the Man Act thing, uh, in the Prohibition we have a, 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 an alliance of forces, what, what Megan always referred to as the uplift. Now, we, 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 some refer to the uplift. You know, it was the idea that you, you, and you out there should be uplifted. If you don't like to be uplifted, you don't like the idea of being freed of the curse of demon John Barleycorn, you're going to jolly well be compulsorily uplifted. <laughs> uh, now this idea, of course, William Graham Sumner in his great essay of what social classes owe to each other, and his, his, his concept of the forgotten man, I think is a definitive statement on this. Uh, his description of, the, of, the mor of moral uplift was that A and B put their heads together to decide what C should be made to do for D. And... Uh, in, in the prohibition case, it works something like this. A and B are, the, are, are reformers, are moral uplifters. They get their heads together and they say, liquor is evil, or you, know, you have more accidents and all that sort of stuff, and people get liver ailments, etc., etc. Therefore, because a lot of people become alcoholic, therefore we should outlaw liquor. So the essence of this is that A and B, who don't drink anyway, uh, are forcing C, who's a forgotten man, he's the poor schnook who takes a drink once in a while, Force depriving him of liquor in order to save D, the minority, small minority of alcoholics or potential alcoholics. So he goes on from there to say, well, what happens is A and B, of course, you pass the prohibition law, whatever other similar legislation. And A and B, of course, are very happy. They don't drink anyway, and they're imposing their moral standards on everybody else, so they're in great shape. D, the potential alcoholic, can get the liquor anyway. I mean, he knows all sorts of sources, you know, you knock on the window three times, and Joe, you know, Joe's setting me, he gets his liquor. So he gets his liver ailment and dies on his computer anyway. So, so the person who's really the person who's really harmed by this is the poor schnook C, the forgotten man, the poor humble average American, middle America, as we can call it, who likes to drink once in a while and can't doesn't know the illegal sources, doesn't know how to you know speak easy or whatever. And he's the one who's 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 <laughs> who's not being helped anyway, even in the terms of reformers, he's the one who gets shafted by this whole system. Anyway, we have the moral uplifters. Um uh, we have the particularly led, particularly led incidentally, we think again of, of prohibitionists. We think of prohibitionists being sort of a right-wing fundamentalist thing. I mean, especially in these days, we have the prohibition party, sort of a right-wing prohibitionist party. In those days, it was very different. Um, because we have, for example, the social gospel movement, which everybody knows as the great left-wing, in quotes, of the Protestant movement, bringing the message, applying the message of Christianity to social affairs, it's almost always socialistic, in nature, these guys were very happy on prohibition, on outlawing the liquor industry. This is part of the social gospel. Um, Walter Rauschenbusch, uh, in his great work, Christianizing the Social Order, I told him later I was going to talk about Christian America. <laughs> in 1912, Walter Rauschenbusch is again held up by any, any old discussions of the social gospel as being the big theoretician of the, of the of left wing Protestantism of this period. Walter Rauschenbusch in Christianizing Social Order writes that the liquor industry, quote, is seeking to fasten on an angry people a relic of barbarism. That's liquor. Who you win? Seeking to fasten on an angry people a relic of barbarism, which the awakened conscience and the scientific intellect of the world are combining to condemn. Now here's the key. Here's the key phrase. It's this great alliance, you see, of the awakened conscience. That's the that's the fundamentalist crazy sort of thing. <laughs> that's the that's the that's the moral argument against liquor. Combined with a scientific intellect, and this is the new scientific technicians, because the scientific technicians, while all this was taking place, were also in favor of prohibition, using scientific arguments, using statistics. You know, the more alcoholics die in the gutter, or more alcoholics get blind, <laughs> and, uh, and you can say, yeah, statistically, it's very true. More alcoholics have cirrhosis of the liver. More alcoholics, well, there's no one in view as much. The more alcoholics have automobile accidents, and on and on. More alcoholics go, you know, go crazy, and so forth. And so here we have the scientific reformer, our, our expert, our technician, our social worker, our social scientist, combined with the social gospel. We have this magnificent fusion of uh, Christian theology and, sci and science. I mean, what could, be, what could be more powerful than that? Uh, the Reverend Josiah Strong, for example, another eminent social gospeler, 1909, writes that industrial work, they're coping with the industrial system. They came to the conclusion industrial work increased one's desire for alcohol. 
because normally what they mean by this is you work, you know, eight hours or ten hours or something, and you suddenly <laughs> you're kind of tired, you like to have a drink. Uh, and so he says, so it's, it's very important to, in order to stop, you know, in order to stop urban congestion you know, and the shame of the cities and all that, this, this leads, industrial work leads to further congestion. What you have to do uh, to, uh, let's leave this. Oh, so what, what happens to them is they get high wages. Of course, they, they're congested, they're tired after a hard day's work and they assembly line. And they have, unfortunately, have high wages. This is very interesting for a left-wing social gospeler. And their high wages lead them to be a little more affluent. And so they buy, they, they, they're led then, quote, to buy drink and acquire the liquor habit before they have developed a more refined taste of a higher civilization. So obviously what the conclusion for this is, you stop them, you outlaw the liquor, you refine them up. It's sort of like, this is Galbraith in the ministerial court. You refine them upward, and maybe after that you can, you know, maybe after several centuries you can allow them to drink, even though, of course, they wouldn't want to drink by that point. Um, and in 1940, and then pushing uh, for prohibition, urban strong force also. The Gospel of the Kingdom magazine writes in 1914, uh, hailing this great drive toward prohibition, which is spreading through the states and now, you know, it's obviously looming up for the federal government. Uh, the Gospel of the Kingdom magazine writes, quote, personal liberty, and they say this with, a, you know, in other words, in quotes, with obviously deep contempt. Personal liberty, they say, is at last an uncrowned, dethroned king with no one to do him reverence. Dot, dot, dot. We are no longer frightened by that ancient bogey paternalism in government. We affirm boldly it is the business of government to be just that, paternal. Nothing human can be foreign to a true government. I like that. I guess it doesn't ring to it. <laughs> um, and one of the problems is, perhaps fortuitously, that of course, as I say, uh, Catholics tend to drink uh, in at least moderate amounts. Uh, and, and, and we have this part of this whole thing was an anti Catholic drive. The Catholics were not shaping up in this, in this great, uh, <laughs> this great uh, drive toward purity and temperance. Um, and Catholics are largely immigrants. I mean, you know, this is largely, you know, largely true. Um, so then we have, so in addition to the uplift in the Gospel of the Kingdom magazine, Walter Rauch and Butcher, Reverend Josiah Storm, and some of my other favorites, we have uh, the scientific argument, the, uh, the, the, the uplift argument, the, the harmful effects of alcohol, alcohol leads to crime, the poverty, et cetera, et cetera. Interestingly enough, we have this interesting twist. I wonder how some of these, our current social workers would, would sort of cotton to this. They had this kind of an attitude, this, the, science, the scientists, they said, the scientific social worker types. They said, man is determined by his environment. If, if a person is poor, and he's unhappy, and so forth and so on, it's not because he doesn't have a job or whatever. It's not because he's, he's personally at fault. That's an ancient reactionary 19th century lazy affair attitude. That he's a, that's his personal character is at fault. No, no, it's his environment that is at fault. All right, so it's his environment. He, he is determined by his environment. He's a poor puppet creature of the environment. So, so the way to help him out, the way to cure his poverty and his slum conditions and his unemployment, et cetera, et cetera, is to change the environment. What's the environment? The environment's liquor. <laughs> the saloon, the neighborhood saloon, standing there with evil temptation, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and uh, so therefore, the way to help his environment is to outlaw the saloon, outlaw liquor, and so forth. All the progressive social scientists, our beloved friends from other, from other, our other, <laughs> our other meetings here, uh, Edward A. Ross, one of the great founders of scientific sociology, Simon Nelson Patton, the progressive economist, Irving Fisher, now beloved and then beloved, uh, uh, a compulsory vegetarian as well as compulsory prohibitionist, <laughs> uh, all these people uh, pushing the idea of, of outlawing liquor as part of this great new social science, is applying the lessons of social science to, to, the, to, the, to the public. And uh, and the social workers, as I said, going on, going on very neatly with this. The, uh, there's also, in addition to this, interestingly enough, I mean, I've already talked about ethnic, religious or religio-ethnic determinism and a little bit of and the, our, our friends with social scientists again. We also have some economic determinism in work, more directly. And that's many big businessmen, We're back to our big business friends again, who believe it was, it was in the very necessity, it was, it was necessary for workers to be, to be sober. There's this whole tradition, by the way, in, in Western civilization, if I know it. For example, in England, the mercantilists, many of the mercantilist theoreticians in England in the 17th and 18th century were constantly saying, we, we shouldn't have higher wages. Higher wages are bad. Why? Because we increase wage rates, the workers will just get drunk on Monday as well as Sunday, and on Friday as well as Saturday, they just won't work. And the economics is known as the theory of the backwards sloping supply curve of labor, which, is, as far as I know, has never been substantiated. 
At any rate, so they just won't work. They just work less, so you may as well, you know, pay them lower wages and make them work harder. And part of the, and, and part of this thing is again, this is evil of drunkenness. These guys will go out there, they'll be, they'll be relaxed a little bit, and this will reduce their, you know, hard work and their efficiency. So, so many businessmen now get to the, the point of favoring prohibition in order to sober the workers up. They won't have the temptation, they won't have the liquor, they'll be on the job more rapidly, and they'll be and then they're working harder, and so forth, and so, so on. Uh, also, there'll be more safety at work. And here we have, here we have, you see, the claim of the workman's compensation laws. Now that employers are liable by law for the accidents on the job, if keep liquor away from these guys, then they won't have so many accidents. It will cut down the cost of the employer. It's a beautiful reinforcement of one state isn't piling up on top of another. Um... Uh, and we begin to have a situation where many businessmen engage in voluntary prohibition. In other words, as a condition of employment, no, no workers should be, first of all, drinking on the job, and, and many of the more far out employers, and no workers should be drink, period, even off the job. The railroads were, were pioneering this great effort. Uh, the railroads had negligence laws, again, liability, special liability laws to, to, to worry about, too. Um, so the railroads began, began to to lay down the rule that no worker can drink either on duty or off duty, ever, period. Uh, and the next step, of course, then, if you really want to enforce this with some of the employers, did, but it's kind of expensive to do it, as well as a little bit messy, is to hire groups of agents, detectives, espionage agents, whatever, go around and see whether the guy's drinking or not. Because otherwise, what's the point of having a <laughs> rule? Um, and the found out, you see, when the railroads, it's true, I have to give the devil their its due here, that that when, when the railroads passed this rule of no drinking either on or off the job, there was a decline of railway accidents, no question about it. And this was a sort of a model and inspiration for other employers in manufacturing. Uh, and the scientific management movement, which comes in around this period, uh, Frederick M. Taylor, uh, <coughs> pushing the idea also, uh, in addition to firming up the assembly lines over and so on, of eliminating alcohol because alcohol lowers efficiency. And uh, so, so you have this, this, this other aspect to, to the prohibition movement. And in addition to that, we have special regional kind of situation. For example, the dry, there are many dry states in the South, for example, many states which had state prohibition. Still is, still are, almost. At any rate, the, the businessmen in the dry states wanted to impose national prohibitions so that the wet state people wouldn't have this, this advantage. We can, we can, uh, <laughs> we can, we can, you know, Impose this throughout the country, uh, and the you know, American business in general also wanted national prohibition in order to firm up the American labor force and be able to compete against these drunken people, drunken workers abroad. This will increase <laughs> increase our productivity in the you know in world markets. And in addition to the sort of general business uh, sympathy to prohibition, we had. Certain specific businesses, which are even more economically determined in favor of prohibition. In other words, when economics is known as substitutes, or I wouldn't say close, it's hard to say close substitutes, but sort of substitutes. The closest we can think of to liquor are uh, grape juice and Coca Cola. Most grape juice company and Coca Cola company push very hard for prohibition, for the outlawing of liquor. And, and I, will, I, I, again, I think it couldn't, cannot be purely coincidence that they were the close, at least the closest substitutes we have to liquor. <laughs> Uh, the uh, the anti saloon league, for example, of course, what we all know is the major was a major pressure group uh, for prohibition. Had a committee of industrialists on it, and and uh, many of these people were in this to push this uh, kind of system. On the other hand, you see there were, there were of course certain businesses which are strongly anti prohibition. Not, I think not, the majority were probably in favor of prohibition. Um, there was a few businesses that were opposed to prohibition. For example, obviously the brewing industry and the rest of the liquor industry. That's that question. And also the Duponts, who were being Catholic, again were very unsympathetic of prohibition uh, on religious grounds. And so we had this this kind of this kind of a breakdown. Uh, labor unions uh, tended to be in favor of prohibition. Well, they had a problem. Because after all, the brewers, their brewing brothers, <laughs> would be thrown out of work. Uh, there wasn't necessarily it wasn't too much distilling going on. It was mostly most of the liquor industry in that in those days was beer brewing. Um, the uh, the labor unions, but aside from of course the problem about the brewing brothers who would be kicked out of work, labor unions also tend to be pro favor prohibition. Some of the arguments are kind of cute. We'll be reminiscent of certain current current trends on the on the Maoist the Maoist left. For example, uh, uh, one of the unions uh, claimed that. Many of the unions claim that alcohol, quote, those class consciousness, unquote, on part of the workers. 
and so a lot of the numbers of alcohol is the opium of the, of the, of the masses. And it does that fighting spirit. So if you, if you have prohibition, it just means that the workers will be on the TV and be able to fight the bosses better. Drinking, in other words, is a class enemy. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the Knights of Labor, who are, I guess, are still a remnant of them around in, in these days, uh, fired organizers, any organizers who drank uh, on the job or even off it, and excluded any, any liquor traffickers or liquor industry workers from, from uh, membership. Uh, the railroad union, the railroad brotherhoods, the, four, the big four were all in favor of prohibition. The, um, <coughs> the AFL could not take a stand because of the split in you know, the liquor industry, etc. Liquor workers, obviously. The, uh, but there were some, there were many unions, however, which opposed it on other bases. They opposed, they didn't like the whole idea. Some of them actually worry about personal liberty. Uh, and the loss of the saloons, uh, especially the foreign-born workers and those, you know, the ethnic neighborhood types, the Catholic workers, etc., who are in this, who are in this thing, and uh, who are members of unions. Um, the Socialist Party, as usual, was split, split uh, somewhere down the middle between the pro-prohibitionists and the anti-prohibitionists. The uh, John Spargo, who later turned the great theoretician of the Socialist Party, later to turn up as a pro-war socialist. Wilson is one of Wilson's great pals in the war, in the war effort. He was in favor of prohibition because he considered it parasitic and inefficient in lowering productivity and so forth. You know, <clears throat> you know, another, another interesting argument by Spargo in favor of prohibition was this. Okay, you guys are worried because, because uh, prohibition interferes with personal liberty, but he says all, all legislation interferes with personal liberty. So what are you, what are you griping about? <laughs> <laughs> But the most socialist party members are probably against prohibition. Again, the German influence, the influence of the, those Germans, the Germans are very heavily involved in the socialist party and, and, uh, and uh, from the great brewing tradition <laughs> were opposed to it. But uh, the, um, okay, the brewer, the saloon setup, as I said, saloons were, were the, uh, a basic local, uh, part of local control. The saloon setups were, um, I say, uh, were, Largely owned by the brewers, the brewing industry. The, the situation there was like Rheingold would own their saloons and Peel would own its saloons and so forth. There were an enormous number of retail outlets that were all over the place, in, in, especially in the cities. Um, and they had, uh, they had, they were, they were closely involved. Again, the saloons. I'll get into this later tomorrow night when I talk about urban crime and ethnic, urban and crime and ethnic problems, etc. Uh, one of the problems is that. The, the, usually the brewers, the saloons were tightly licensed. You had to get licenses and so forth and so on. In order to get the licenses and pay the taxes and all the rest of it, you had to dicker with local politicians. So there was a symbiotic relationship between local board healing politicians and local saloons and the, and the, and the brewing industry, as a result of which we had so-called corruption and crime rampant. In other words, you, know, you had to, in order to get it, be in business, you had to get to the, buy, pay off the politician in order to keep the competitor out and so forth and so on. The whole kind of symbiosis also most of these brewers, most of the saloons confronted the Sunday closing laws, which is one of the you know, remnants of uh, one of the uh, elements of uh, Puritanism here. And the brewing, the, brew, the saloons wanted to stay open on Sunday, which is not part of not part of the German or ethnic Catholic ethnic tradition to have any kind of Sunday closing. In order to stay open on Sunday, they have to pay off the politicians and won't close you down. So this whole this whole thing uh, was involved in this. Also, you had to pay off the police, of course. So the whole police and local government machines were wrapped up in the whole saloon caper. Um, and in return for the force of for the politician uh, favoring the local saloon keeper, the saloon keeper, in addition to paying him off, had another force very important function, which was to pull out the votes to re-elect the politician who was his friend. And the saloon keeper being looked up to by the urban ethnic uh, in the neighborhood was, was able to pull out votes uh, fairly steadily and as far as uh, the machine politicians could estimate their votes very closely. <laughs> Many of the saloon keepers became aldermen themselves or city councilmen and so forth. Uh, another thing, of course, which increased the symbiosis with local corrupt machines, in quotes, and increases the political incentive for the, uh, up, for the upper class, lost business establishment, reforming corporate establishment to smash the saloons. Another, uh, another element here is that since the saloons were sort of, not exactly illegal, but sort of quasi-illegal because of all these Sunday closing and licenses and all the rest of it anyway, along with saloons came other services. Uh, which, which ethnics, urban ethnic immigrants, etc., uh, 
enjoy uh, openly, let's say, which which drove uh, Baptist <laughs> Methodist wasps up the wall, namely gambling and prostitution. So the saloons became sort of centers of gambling and prostitution or allied to it. So we have this whole set then of this, this kind of moral conflict, uh, symbiotic with political, ethnic, and all the rest of the conflict uh, emerging in the progressive uh, period. The progressive party naturally, naturally of course, kind of could be deduced from our analysis, but wholeheartedly in favor of prohibition. And finally, there's a progressive war that put prohibition over the top. Uh, I mentioned about the anti-German thing in the war, just, just the one, two quotes, two quotes and I'll be finished. The anti-Saloon League writes dur uh, during the war, quote, the German brewers in this country have rendered thousands of men inefficient, uh, thus crippling the Republic in its war on Prussian militarism. <laughs> <And quote. laughs> I think that's one of the better quotes of the, uh, of the week. Uh, another one, another prohibitionist writes, quote, we have German enemies in this country, t in this country too, and that was not just abroad, and the worst of all our German enemies, the most treacherous, the most menacing, are Paps, Schlitz, Blatz, and Miller. <laughs> 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 <Again>. <laughs>